For those of you that um, don't know Patty, um, I think I have this correct, Tamara's niece, is that correct? Tamara Steffens. And um, it's been a while since we've been uh, in touch with Patty, and so we're interested to hear what Patty's up to next. And so Patty, come and share with us.
<laughs> um, so I'm Patty Cooper, and um, I am Tamara and Chad's niece, as he said. Um, and I am going to be talking today about becoming a missionary. Um, I will show how God has been preparing me for most of my life, um, how I've been guided to accept and embrace the unknown, when I realized it was time to answer his call, and what I hope to accomplish as a missionary. I believe God started preparing me for missionary work long before I ever considered it. Proverbs 3, 5, and 6 states, Trust in the Lord with all your heart, and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct your paths. This scripture has helped me realize that I need to trust God in all ways, for he has a plan for me. He will guide us through the unknowns we all encounter in life. Uh, there have been a few major examples in my life where I have been in unknown situations. The ones I would like to use today are when I moved to Washington, joined the military, deployed to Afghanistan, and applied to be a missionary. Um, my siblings and I moved in with Tamara and Chad in 2006 when I was 15. This involved being introduced to a new school and a new church. We were raised by our grandparents, so this involved a new lifestyle as well. I remember how scary and stressful it was when we first moved to Washington. We were all facing this unknown path in life, and it was terrifying. God was with us, though, and he helped my relationship with the Stefan family grow. God has blessed me with Tamara and Chad, who are like parents to me. I am also blessed that Garrett and Sadie consider me a sister. Um, I grew up in the Catholic Church. We went every Sunday with our grandparents. Um, I often fell asleep during the services. It's hard for a child to feel engaged when half the sermon is in Latin. But our grandparents did tell us about Jesus, and I knew he died for our sins. Um, I just didn't have a personal relationship with him. I can still remember going to the SDA church for the first time. I'm positive the Holy Spirit was present in my life before. But this was the first time I sensed it guiding me to have a relationship with Jesus. I was in a very different environment than the one I grew up in, and even though I felt unsure about almost everything that was happening in my life, I felt I was where I belonged. I felt like I had found my home. I attended CCA my sophomore through senior years. I had amazing Christian experiences and met the people that would become my lifelong friends. I was developing a relationship with Jesus, and my faith was growing. It was around this time that I first heard about missionaries, and I felt a stirring in my heart that this was something I could do. We even went on a short mission trip to Mexico to help an orphanage. I didn't give mission work much thought after the short mission trip, and instead focused on my friends and my studies. I graduated in 2009, and I felt hopeful for my future. College awaited, I wanted to be a social worker like my aunt. I made excuses that it wasn't the right time to be a missionary. I wasn't ready to sacrifice my time and effort for God. I attended Wenatchee Valley College after graduation, and this is when I began feeling restless. When I was 19 years old, I decided to join the Army. Even though this would be one of the greatest unknowns I would face, I was eager and wanted to go on an adventure. I left for training January 2011. Oh, sorry, you can't really read that. Basic training was harder than I imagined it would be. I missed my family, and I was only allowed to call home once a week. Standing in the phone line was honestly the hardest part for me. I hadn't realized I would miss my family as much as I did, or that I would only be able to speak with them for a few minutes once a week. I graduated basic training in June of 2011 and felt ready to begin my adventure. I catch up, sorry. I found out as soon as I arrived at my duty station in Kansas that I was deploying to Afghanistan at the end of the year. 
This was a shock and a terrible surprise for my family and me. I distinctly remember feeling such anxiety. I had been eager to deploy and thought it would be this amazing adventure, but suddenly I was again facing the unknown. My unit and I trained for about six months for deployment, and yet I was still unprepared for what I would experience in Afghanistan. By the time I deployed in January 2012, my faith was shaky and I no longer had a strong relationship with Jesus. Um, most of the people in Afghanistan are extremely poor. Most don't have running water or electricity. Children often don't have clothes and would beg for clean water. Everyone wears similar clothing and this was actually one of the biggest culture shocks. It was strange looking out and not seeing individuality expressed in clothing. The local police are corrupt and often inflict harm rather than protect their citizens. This was especially difficult for us to witness as it was our mission to train the local police. Deployment was an unpleasant experience in many ways. We were unwelcome and every day there was the threat that I might not survive. Throughout deployment, I'm ashamed to admit I didn't pray often and rarely thought about God. Despite this, he still protected me. Amen. When we were almost done with deployment, uh, we had about three months left, we were in the process of handing our mission over to the National Guard unit that was taking our place. Every day for about two weeks, we went out on mounted patrols with the National Guard unit so they could see how we executed our mission. The last day we were supposed to go along with them, my squad leader said it would be fine if I stayed behind. The National Guard unit felt their gunners knew what they were doing well enough that they didn't need them to come along. I was a gunner for our team. Um, that day, as the convoy was returning to the Kandahar Air Force Base, where we were located, um, through the same entrance we always used, they were hit with IEDs. The truck I was supposed to be in that day was hit hardest. Uh, the gunner and driver died instantly, and the team leader was severely injured. If I had not been told to stay behind, I would have been killed that day. God wanted me to trust him, and unfortunately, even with such obvious proof of his love and protection, I instead felt angry and alone. After deployment, I still had four years left in the military. I was surrounded by negativity, and it was difficult for me to express my faith. My relationship with Jesus was practically non-existent. I never forgot that he died for my sins, but I didn't seek him out or pray much anymore. I should have understood after the year in Afghanistan that God would protect me and had a purpose for my life. I'm not certain where my relationship with Jesus would be today if I had stayed in the army. I do know that my family has been such a positive force in my life and they are a major part of the reason I am willing and able to accept the mission call today. And Jesus came and spoke to them saying, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age, amen. Matthew 28, 18 through 20. A representative from Adventist Frontier Missions came to Wenatchee last year and spoke about missionaries and the important work they're doing all over the world. He explained how there are still billions of people who don't know about Jesus or even have access to the gospel. I felt such a profound sorrow when I heard this. We are surrounded by technology in America and information can be retrieved at the swipe of a finger. I also felt ashamed that I take for granted how blessed I am and that I hadn't done more to reach others. I heard this verse and felt in my very soul that God was calling me. My faith has been growing since I've been home and I've been learning to lean on and trust God. After hearing God's mission call to me, I discussed it with Tamar and Chad and they agreed it was time to apply to be a missionary. The missionary application is a long process. 
It was a few months before I knew if I was even a viable candidate to be a missionary through Adventist Frontier Missions. I was dedicated to becoming a missionary, but even though my relationship with Jesus has grown, I was still anxious and impatient. I began worrying about things that were out of my control, and I sometimes wondered if I had misunderstood God's call. Of course, God was ready with an answer. I am studying to be an accountant at Central Washington University. In February, I received a phone call from Adventist Frontier Missions asking if I would accept a call to be a missionary in Africa. They had an accounting need in Fria, Guinea. Right there. <laughs> this was very exciting news, and it truly felt as if God was speaking directly to me. There aren't many accounting calls for missionaries, and so I hadn't applied for any. I had applied to three calls, um, one in the Philippines, Cambodia, and Kazakhstan, but they were all English teaching calls. God knows that I enjoy accounting, and he provided an opportunity where I could answer his command while also pursuing a career I'm passionate about. He proved again that he is actively working in my life. I have since been in contact with the Coker family. And that's them right there. Um, they are in charge of the Susu Project in Fria, Guinea. They run an English teaching school, and I will be um, completing accounting and administration tasks while also teaching English as needed. Um, okay, a little bit about Fria, Guinea. It's um, about two to three hours from the capital city, Conakry. It is a Muslim community with French and Susu as the primary languages. The town of Fria was built around bauxite mining in 1957. It used to have good facilities, water, electricity, schools, housing, even hospitals. The last company mining there began to decrease activities in 2008 after a financial crisis and a fall in aluminum prices. Because of this, the population has increasingly lived in poverty uh, with high rates of unemployment. Families that used to provide for their extended families cannot today afford to care for the needs of their own children and immediate relatives. God has been preparing me to embrace the unknown my entire life. Sorry. He has called me to Africa and he has reassured me that I can trust him and can accomplish his will as a missionary. I will be working as an accountant and I believe God put me in this position for a reason. God's children are lost, and I am eager to guide them to God through my actions as a missionary. I will praise you, O Lord, with my whole heart. I will tell of all your marvelous works. I will be glad and rejoice in you. I will sing praise to your name, O Most High. Psalm 9, 1 and 2. Um, I am now going to play a video clip from the Susu Chronicles. Um, this particular clip is the story of Isida Coker and her journey to Christ. Um, the Coker family is who I will be staying with, so this was uh, kind of a neat clip that I was able to find. Okay. about my mission work while he's setting that up? Uh, oh, yes, that's a good, important part. Um, I'm leaving in the end of August of this year. I'm heading to missionary training July 21st, and I'll be there for a month. Where is the training? Um, in Michigan, the Adventist College there. I can't remember. Andrews University, yeah. How long will you be gone? Um, a year. 11 months um, specifically, so, yeah. <laughs> yeah, um, I received an email recently and they actually have pretty good electricity now, so um, I'm supposed to bring a Wi-Fi modem and um, they said I could call home at least once a week, so <laughs> I'm sure that'll be nice for them too. Did you say they speak French and Susu? Yeah. Yeah, Susu is the kind of native language, and then they were occupied by the French in the early years, long ago. <laughs> is there an Adventist church in the area 
Um, I believe so. I think they've established one. That's what the, the Cokers have been there since 2012, and they took over the Susu project from the Coleman family. Um, that's who was talking to Isa Coker is um, Mr. Coleman in this, so you'll see them. And then they run an English teaching school, so. Okay, so yes, I have to um, spend 15 hours a week learning French. And I have to, like, I have to document that, and then I'm sure whenever I talk to someone, it'll hopefully help me learn. <laughs> so you've already started? I have, actually. It's a very hard language. It's <laughs> not been easy. <laughs> okay, so this is um, I said a Coker story. experience at this age that led her to Christ. It is very difficult having to live with your parents, all of them are Muslim, and you decide to pick up the cross and follow Christ. When I was at uh, the age of 16, I, I was staying with my siblings, half-siblings, and uh, I'm very close to one of them called Yusuf. So one day, he came over to me. He was so excited, running, and he came and said, I want to share something with you, and I want it to be just a secret between you and I. I was accompanying my girlfriend, and I heard a sermon. And this is not my first time I've been hearing about Jesus, and it kind of touches me a whole lot. Then he went down, started sharing everything about how Jesus Christ is our personal savior, what Jesus Christ went through, dying on the cross to save us from our sins. So I became interested. So one day, he and I decided to go to the church. There is no way my father should get to know about this because he would disown me and drive me out of the house. But by then I had a boyfriend named Sheikh. Um, he took got interested at some point in with me, but there was some kind of misunderstanding. He got angry, so he said, well, I'm not supposed to go back to the church. I said, no, I'm going to go there. Nobody will stop me. So one day there was a fundraising service. Service, I was really enjoying the service and singing to good songs and suddenly I had somebody tapping my back. Somebody's calling me outside, somebody's calling me. I said, oh, no, no, I'm coming. He said, oh, somebody wants to see. The person said, if you refuse to call, he's going to call in. I said, okay, hold on, let me go and see this person. To my best, greatest surprise, it was my boyfriend waiting outside. I said, come in. He said, I told you not to come here. But he grabbed my hand forcefully and started pushing me. Why are you treating me like this? He said, I am not coming to the church anymore. And I don't want you to come to the church. I said, I'm sorry. It's not going to work that way. He actually beat me. He said, well, I'm going to talk to my dad. It was the saddest day. He said, what? You mean my daughter going to church? But I just stood silent, speechless, because it was a shock for me. Then my dad asked me, I said, yes, sir, I've been going to church. He has a big ring, heavy, thick silver ring in his hand. He hit my face. Who allow you? It is an abomination for you to be going to church. Don't you know that? Are you trying to disgrace me? I stood there speechless, just crying. At some point, he calmed himself down and he said, I want you to promise me that you will never go to the church. So I actually accepted in front of him, but my intentions were different. So the 
day he found out was the worst, he said, so you defy me. You defy my words. He was so angry. So my mom, the sooner she overheard the conversation, she came running. She said, let us drive out of this house because she's a disgrace to the family. My dad drove me out of the house. And he took all my things. I only had one outfit with me. The one I had on is what I went out with. In the evening, I'll come around the house, but nobody sees me, just my siblings, and they will give me food. Finally, my, my mom went to some people, all the people that are well-respectable in the community. She spoke to them, and they came to my dad, and they talked to my dad. He, he asked me again, I should promise him that I will not go to the church. I cannot make the promise again. By then, he fell sick, seriously sick. My dad and I were so close, even all, with all that has happened, I was the only person that allowed to cook his food, sit beside him to eat, give him his medication. Everything is all isotope. One day, it was getting worse. It was hard for me to understand that he, he's dying. I said, Dad, I want you to take Jesus Christ as your personal savior. I said, he's the only one that can save you. I said, Prophet Muhammad cannot save you. You have to accept Jesus Christ as your personal savior. He is the one that died on the cross for you and I. By then I was crying anyway. I said, Dad, this is the only opportunity you have. When you die, it's finished. Just talk to me, I beg you. I was pleading with him. He said, I will never and ever accept Christ as my Savior. Prophet Muhammad is my Savior. That was the end of our discussion. I left out crying because it was hard for me. Coming from a Muslim background, accepting Christ as your Savior, it's not an easy task. I just want to encourage whether you are Muslim, Buddhist, whosoever you are, that Christ is the only way, truth, and the life. There is no other way. Tamara to have our closing prayer. Mighty God, thank you so much that you are a divine puzzle maker in our lives. Thank you for the pieces that you are putting together in Patty's life. Uh, thank you that she is trusting you to complete that picture. I pray that you will protect her along each step and continue to inspire her to love you deeper every day. And Lord, may each of us be inspired as well to submit to your will, to submit to the unknown, to trust you that you are creating a plan where you want to use our gifts and our talents to bless those and to lead others to you, that we may populate heaven with incredible joy. And thank you, Father, for bringing us together on this day uh, it's part of that divine puzzle, too, and there's no accident that we are here. For whatever reason, Lord, we ask that you will continue to inspire our hearts. I pray that you will remind everyone who has heard of the story that every time it comes to mind again, please pray for Patty and pray for those that she is serving, which is obviously primarily you, but everyone that she is touching, Lord, I pray that you will um, bring it to our hearts that we can submit to prayer. And thank you for a beautiful Sabbath day. May we grow in it and in you. In Jesus' name I pray it. Amen. Amen.